Hi everybody, uh, my name is uh, Dave uh, Nettleton. I'm a product manager here at uh, Google Cloud and I'm looking forward to talking to you about where to store your stuff. Um, so I've been with Google now for about uh, five years, working on a range of different uh, storage products uh, throughout that time. I'm just excited to share with you about some of what we've uh, built over that uh, time period and where we are. Um, so agenda, we'll cover three main topics. So first of all, I'll just sort of step back a little bit and talk about how the storage landscape has evolved over the years, um, actually starting with from on-premises through to the evolution in cloud. Um, I'll talk about storage and I'll also uh, briefly touch on uh, the evolution of databases as well as some of the other options from where, where you might store your, store your data. I'll dive in a little bit on some of the storage options uh, for, for Google Cloud and then uh, end with a wrap up on uh, where to learn um, uh, and some, some more uh, follow-up information. Uh, first of all, just safe hard for a statement in case I make any uh, forward-looking uh, uh, statements. Um, and with that, let's dive in. So a brief history of storage and databases. So uh, let's start with the evolution of storage. Um, and you know, different categories of storage have uh, developed over the years. These are like are the main ones. And maybe starting at the left is the sort of easiest one to think about, which is direct attached storage. So this is storage that is physically attached to the local machine. So your laptop operates, you know, like has this, uh, your desktop machine would have this, where the storage is physically attached uh, to the device, the file system is sitting locally and the applications are running on the device as well. So these are super high performance uh, devices. They're great for, you know, day-to-day -day work. And you know, one of the downsides, of course, is that it's a very sort of localized and sealed system and you, you can't share easily data with everybody else uh, from the device. You have to go over the network. So um, on the on the right there, you'll see three different ways that data is you know often sort of shared over a network. Um, in the first one, um, you know, a type of storage called block storage is stored over the network. Um, so this is very popular for, uh, for example, database applications where the database server might be running in a particular machine, but the uh, the, the storage itself is accessed uh, and provisioned over a network um, um, so that it can be uh, managed and scaled uh, separately. Um, and uh, the you know the file system is local to, for example, where the database might be running, um, um, and then uh, the file system communicates over the network with in what's called block uh, block sizes or blocks of data that might come in eight k, sixteen k, even sixty four k chunks. And this is a very efficient way to send data over the network. Um, it's not always that great for sharing the data because the the way the data is managed is very tied to the file system, and that's tied on that machine shared with the with the application. Um, you know, uh, uh, another very, very popular form of storage, which I think many people will have heard of, is sort of file shares, file storage. So here you can imagine there's a remote file server for your organization, um, and the application or the device remotely uh, accesses the data over that uh, file share. So many users can access that file system over the network um, uh, and then access that data to their uh, application. It's a lot more complicated to build because now you have to deal with many users accessing the same data and you have to build various locking and other semantics to be able to manage that. Um, but it's a very, very popular, very powerful form of uh, storage. And then finally, a class of storage that, um, you know, it started, it was starting to emerge on premises, but really took off with the advent of the public cloud was object storage. Um, so this was a, uh, initially started as a, uh, a, a type of storage where um, you, know, you have really large amounts of unstructured storage and you can reference each piece of it uh, individually. It's great for things like uh, backup um, and archiving where systems could offload data to this cheaper form uh, of storage over the network. Instead of a file system API, it had an object API that made it super easy to scale uh, very, very, very broadly. Um, and if I map these, um, pro these sort of categories to Google Cloud, um, you know, for block storage, either direct attached or like the storage area network, our equivalent products are local SSD for a direct attached and then persistent disk. And these let you create uh, and attach uh, block storage to uh, VMs uh, in particular. Um, uh, network attached storage, this is file storage, file share. So Cloud File Store is the product that we have in that category. We acquired a company called Elastifile uh, to support us in that a few years ago. And we also have actually a number of really uh, great partners in this category too. You know, this is the, a, a, a category that's very rich, has a very rich uh, history and a very rich set of fi uh, features. We want to support our customers and partners with a rich set of options in Google Cloud. So we offer NetApp, Dell EMC, 
uh, and DDM as options uh, for that. And then for uh, object storage, our native cloud product is uh, Google Cloud uh, Storage. So rich set of capabilities here uh, to support these uh, uh, categories. Uh, so let me now move on to talk a little bit about the uh, evolution of uh, databases. And really, um, uh, some you know, 30 or 40, 50 years ago, this was really dominated by the sort of the traditional um, relational database um, management systems, where you know customers are looking for systems to capture uh, transactional records. Classically, um, the example is the, um, the financial record where you're debiting one account and crediting in another, and you want to make sure that happens as a single operation. These relate, you know, the RDBMS systems uh, became the mainstay of very many enterprise applications uh, for managing their uh, their data. Um, Data was then uh, lifted from these and moved over to uh, a data warehouse via ETL processes, extract, transform, load, that would restructure the data and then provide it for uh, analytics and reporting. And this tradition, this was then the data warehouse industry, the database industry. This was a many, many billion dollar industry um, that um, was uh, grew very strongly for, for many years. Um, one of the challenges with this, though, was that all these systems were what were called scale-up systems. So they'd build, if you want more data, you'd have to you know, attach more storage, attach a bigger single machine to that. Um, and as data and the world became co became more connected, more types of data were generated that these systems couldn't really manage at scale. So a number of different types of storage then um, emerged. Um, you know, One of the earliest ones of these was uh, the data lake and Hadoop where huge amounts of data is getting generated, lots of unstructured data. Customers weren't always clear what they were going to do with that data initially, so they want to store it at scale and then process it and shape it um, for the application of questions that they had. Um, and then um, uh, beyond the uh, large amounts of unstructured data, there's types of data, sort of semi-structured data, um, uh, that uh, customers were gathering either in terms of sort of key values where um, lots of rows of data, but also very many columns, but very sparsely data, uh, very sparsely uh, populated, um, or semi-structured data like JSON data and hierarchical data. And customers needed to store this data at really, really large scale. Um, and the traditional systems weren't always super well set up for that. So a whole new class of sort of NoSQL systems emerged. And then even more recently, um, uh, customers have looked to actually have some of the guarantees and the, the features of relational database systems, but now at a global scale. This has been one of the trade-offs that the industry sort of uh, wrestled with is, you know, having uh, consistent data, um, having it um, uh, very highly available, or being and also being able to partition it and separate it out for scale. So there's something called the CAP theorem that looks at the trade-offs between these. Um, and a lot of systems, you know, really focused on the transaction um, uh, consistency and the availability, and so uh, uh, weren't able to scale. Now, something like Spanner is actually a very interesting scalable relational database system that lets you have and manage transactional records at global scale. And it makes different trade-offs in terms of it provides consistency, it provides partitioning and scale, uh, and then uses uh, atomic clocks to really manage and be very smart about how it deals with um, availability. If we map these to the, uh, the products that we have in GCP for the traditional database system, um, you know, we have uh, Cloud SQL manages the database on your behalf, offering managed uh, MySQL, Postgres, and Microsoft SQL Server. We also have a, a bare metal uh, offering uh, for Oracle systems. Uh, BigQuery is our really large scale uh, data warehouse, a very, very powerful, amazing system for operating at really large scale analytics. Uh, for Hadoop and data lakes, uh, Cloud Data Proc is our managed uh, Hadoop, and that coupled with uh, Cloud Storage that I talked about earlier offers really large scale uh, compute and storage um, uh, disaggregated between the two. Cloud Bigtable and uh, uh, Firestore are our NoSQL products, and then Cloud Spanner, uh, a really unique, um, scalable RDMS system. Okay, let me dive in a little bit on a couple of the storage options, some of their um, um, uh, capabilities, and when you might, uh, what you might use them for. So, Cloud Storage. So this is our object storage product. I've talked a little bit about some of the use cases here. So, content storage and delivery, storing and serving really large amounts of content and delivering it. And delivering those files to users uh, and consumers uh, uh, over the internet. Uh, something a company like Spotify uses Google Cloud Storage heavily for that. Big data and analytics and ML. Um, so the cloud is great for being able to store large amounts of data um, at really low cost and then only bring the compute to bear when you need. So this disaggregation of compute and storage is a super, super powerful way 
uh, to store and manage and scale your data. Um, companies like Twitter use Google for use cases like that, operating at really, really large scale uh, over both data and uh, the computer and analytics side. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you know, backup archival DR, this was the use case that really founded object storage on-premises. But in the cloud, it's, uh, it's actually a, a much smaller portion of the use cases than, um, than many of the others. But you know, object storage is still a great place for storing uh, large amounts of data for uh, backup, for archival, um, uh, et cetera. I'll talk about a couple of the great features that we have in GCS that support these use cases. Probably the first one I really want to talk about is having a single API that works across all of those data, all of that data. So we offer different classes of storage from uh, standard through near line, cold line, uh, and archive. And they offer different price points for the amount of storage, uh, for the price of storage stored per gigabyte, and then the amount it costs to access it. So we offer these different tiers of storage. But uniquely, our archive and coldest tiers is instantly available. Um, so we have that, that API uh, that we use for our standard is available across all tiers, same fast access to all data, millisecond access to all of your data. So all of that archival data is actually online and available to you immediately to use whenever you need it. And that's a very unique and powerful capability. Um, I talked a little bit about some of the big data analytics works use cases. Um, we store our metadata in Spanner, so all our metadata is strongly consistent. This is very powerful um, uh, at the regional level for, uh, for customers. But actually, one of the uh, really nice features of Google Cloud Storage is that um, for uh, our dual regional products, which is where data is stored in, uh, in two regions, um, we can create a single bucket that spans those two regions. And customers don't have to deal with uh, which bucket am I writing to? How do I deal with failover? What am I reading from? We provide a single namespace that can access data in both of those regions, um, which is super powerful for dealing with applications that span multiple regions or that you want to provide business continuity across those. And big uh, highlight of some of our announcements at Next are we're going to expand the capabilities in there to allow customers to choose um, custom dual regions. So instead of just fixed pairs that we'd offered previously, offer flexibility in the choice of those regions. Um, and then also give a, uh, an SLA around um, replication. So uh, three nines SLA for a, a 15 minute replication. Um, persistent disk. So this is our, our, our block storage product. Great product for attaching disks to um, uh, VMs, for example, is the classic use case. If you're in a database in a VM, big data application, then you might want to run, uh, obviously attach disks to that um, um, so that you can get great performance for those applications. Um, and then, um, uh, as well as uh, you know, running those enterprise applications, you also want to be able to protect them um, with high availability or, um, uh, or backup. So we have a rich set of capabilities uh, around that. Key features for this product lineup. So actually a rich set of tiers, uh, all the way giving trade-offs from you know, lowest price performance all the way through to extreme price performance with a, uh, a product we announced recently called Extreme Tier, giving provision performance up to 120,000 IOPS. We also want to make it really easy to use this product. So we make it easy to take those uh, disks and attach them to different VMs. You don't need a stripe or pre-warm for performance. We really want customers to be able to very easily use this product. Um, we also published a number of durability guarantees around the product recently. Um, another unique feature that I'd like to talk about here is also uh, regional PD. So this is the ability to create a disk that spans two zones, and then we synchronously replicate the data between those two zones. So this is, again, a super important feature for enterprises that want to have the very best uh, business continuity and high availability um, uh, controls. Uh, file store. So um, this is the, uh, the file share product where you know, customers are moving from on-premises to Google Cloud. Um, these might be video files that they're sharing. It might be web content, home directories, a lot of very tra classic traditional enterprise use cases here. Got a range of offerings in GCP. File stores the the, the, the product uh, that we have. Within that, we have standard premium tiers. These were zonal products. Um, and now we've just recently announced a new uh, regional uh, enterprise tier, which is based on the Elastifile uh, uh, technology uh, that we acquired uh, a few years ago. Um, and this really lets customers, uh, again, build those really highly available, resilient applications in Google Cloud. We've made sure also this is easy to integrate with the rest of your applications, integrating with all of the you know, VPC service controls and network capabilities that you need for sort of control and security boundaries, uh, together with easy integration with uh, the main compute engines like uh, Google Cloud, uh, Google Compute Engine and 
uh, Google uh, Kubernetes engine, making it really easy through, for example, CSI drivers. Another category of products I just want to talk about briefly, the transfer appliance and service. I've talked a lot about the, you know, the main object file and block storage products that we have in the cloud, but customers want to be able to easily bring data to this cloud, move it to other, uh, move it around within the cloud, and so we have a set of capabilities to help customers with that. So uh, these might be large one-off migrations uh, of data from a data center shutdown, or it might be IoT use cases where data is being gathered at the edge, and then we want to bring the data to the cloud. Um, and so we have two, two main offerings here, transfer appliance, transfer service. Transfer appliance um, offers the ability to, for us to ship you a server, load it up with data, send it back to us, and then we'll load the data into the cloud. Um, we're just recently announcing an online mode for that where you can uh, uh, flick a switch on the appliance that says, hey, any data that goes here, I'd like it to be immediately connected up to the cloud. So if you have a connect, if you can connect that appliance to your network on-premises, you can drop the data onto the appliance and we'll just take care of moving the data up to the cloud from there. If you want more control over transfers, um, we also offer transfer service, which lets you deploy uh, an agent on-premises to manage those transfers. A um, number of great feature enhancements for that recently, uh, providing an API so you can have more programmatic access over it, uh, agent pools to give you more control and parallelism over uploads and control over uh, shared resources like, for example, the, the network. Uh, and then finally, I um, you know, really want to talk about some of our partners, really believe strongly in having a strong uh, partner ecosystem with GCP. Our customers want choice. We want to support them in that. Um, for file, we've got some rich partnerships with um, NetApp, Dell EMC, and DDN. The NetApp offering, you know, for example, SMB capabilities, Dell EMC, uh, high, high, very high performance and scale, and uh, DDN uh, for, uh, for Lustre. Uh, for backup and disaster recovery, again, rich set of uh, capabilities and options for our customers to choose from. A couple of recent highlights, we've integrated with Veeam with their uh, with GCS so that you can now back up directly to GCS as a target in the cloud. Uh, Commvault's offering a rich set of capabilities around backup and data protection for GCVE, our VMware service from uh, GCP. Uh, so finally, uh, I'll just wrap up and uh, leave you with a few uh, resources uh, to help you learn more. Uh, so you know, first of all, just a shout out to some of the other sessions here at Next. Um, some sessions that we have in conjunction with part, uh, customers such as Neuro uh, and Sabre about how they're using Google Cloud Storage um, uh, options to support their use cases, um, and then a, a deeper session on how to build uh, resilient and highly available applications uh, on GCP. Um, I put some links in there to so resources on uh, our web pages, um, and then finally um, a call out to some of our training and certification resources. In, in particular, the Professional Cloud Architect is a is one of the highest paying industry certifications of 2020. A great way to invest in developing your skills for GCP and, and hopefully also your career. And so with that, I'd just like to say thank you very much for joining me today and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.